singularity, the merger of AI and singularity, and some sort of a fabric to connect all of the blockchains together. Huge and, uh, huge and worthy goals. And I'd say, uh, I'd say we're trying to do something, hopefully, well, certainly as difficult as that, uh, and that's try and help people trying to get bank accounts, you know, in a way. So I wonder if I may do a show of hands. Uh, who here has a cryptocurrency business where they've got an amazing banking relationship that will allow them to scale to, you know, a billion dollars? I'd, I'd expect to see really one show of hand, really, if any. So, uh, so I'll, I'll get on, I'll get on to, to this in a minute. But by way of background, I'm um, Hugh Madden. I am uh, one of the three founders of ANX International. We started out as a, five years ago, a, a Bitcoin exchange called um, ANX Pro. Uh, we then uh, started do also doing a blocks desk called OSL, which is now servicing basically all the world's uh, ICOs because they've got very solid banking and, uh, and converting all their proceeds to cash. We, um, but we also started white labeling of our software, and uh, so now people use it when they want to do AML and KYC um, for the, for the, to be quite legally conservative on their ICOs. So had a bit of a background in, the, in this thing, and certainly a lot, of, a lot of years dealing with the banks, and I spent 20 odd years as a banker before I uh, w went into blockchain. But uh, it, everyone in the business is kind of doing well at the moment, everything's booming, and we had a bit of latitude and so, um, and so we kind of stopped and set up a non-profit, and that non-profit called, was called OpenANX, and we conducted the token sale, and, and the purpose of that is to bridge traditional financial markets and the decentralized exchanges. Uh, so decentralized exchanges are widely recognized as a bit of, a, bit of an issue for our, for our whole industry. Um, the, whether we like it or not, most people still pay their bills in traditional fiat currencies. This is how people think and price, and operate in the real world most of the time. However, as funds come in and out of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, they do it through about five banks. There's only really about five banks in the world that are friendly to large-scale cryptocurrency businesses. Okay, so there's a huge risk right there and a bottleneck. Pretty much all the funds go through a handful of exchanges that actually have scale, um, and, and a few little bits and pieces such as US dollar Tether, which is owned by a private company, and maybe a little bit opaque. So you can see there's a real, there's a, there's a real um, bottleneck of real-world funds getting in and out of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Now, why does that matter? Well, if we think about centralized exchanges, um, how do they work? They take your cryptocurrency, they take your dollars, and they make sure they have ownership of both, they have custody of both. And they have to have this because they need to, need to make sure that if a transaction happens between two of their users, they must be able to guarantee their affecting settlement of that trade. So the way centralized exchanges is they must hold your funds, whether it be digital assets or, be, or cash. The problem, of course, is security, fraud, lack of regulation. Over the years, we've seen nonstop problems. At least once every year, there's a major loss. Um, and typically, it's not the dollars that get stolen. If you're swift, maybe, but typically, uh, if, an, if an exchange gets hacked, typically, typically what gets lost is the digital assets. They're gone. So plenty of smart people in the industry have realized that decentralized exchanges is a very good approach. This, with a decentralized exchange, there's only two parties. It's, it's much like a cryptocurrency transaction itself. There's two parties wanting to do an asset swap. They, they agree terms, they affect a trade, and there's no third party who's holding funds in the middle. Uh, in, in, in the banking world, you would call this true DVP. Um, all of the settlement happens, both legs or none of it. So it's clearly the way of the future, and there's a lot of firms working on this. Uh, maybe the downside there is they're also very smart engineers focused on only technology. And so you've got a dozen decentralized exchange projects that focus on pure digital assets. But if you come back to my thinking about centralized exchanges, why do we have these big centralized exchanges and what will it take to move that risk, that systemic risk? How can you move that out of the centralized exchanges? Well, if you're only focusing on crypto assets, that's not going to solve it. The dollars are going to keep going through those five big banking relationships to the five big exchanges. Liquidity is going to stay there. Okay, so if you don't solve the banking problem, you actually don't solve the problem. So our view is that the world, decentralized exchanges are clearly the future, uh, but there's still a role to play with the legacy financial services world. Okay, so our view is that people with strong banking relationships should be really turning into asset gateways. Their role is taking dollars, holding them under custody, and then they should release digitized cash assets 
onto the blockchain where the trading can, can take effect on decentralized exchanges. Uh, that, that certainly solves at least 50% of the problem straight away. If one of these honeypots is hacked, there's only really dollars and the ability to issue more of these tokens which can be throttled. So you kind of remove a lot of that systemic risk straight away. On top of that, the, the FX world has been regulated for about 30 years now. And so what happens in the FX world, in most jurisdictions, if you take customer dollars, you need some sort of a license to do that. You need to have a bare minimum of operating capital, you need to have segregated accounts, you need to have audits, all the things that honestly should be happening to cryptocurrency exchanges right now but aren't, because no regulator has taken that step yet. But they will. So in the next 12 to 18 months, you can certainly see there will be regulations that will cover the dollars. So if the exchanges becomes gateways, the gateways issue, issue tokens, and then we use decentralized exchanges uh, to do our trading, hopefully we've removed that uh, systemic risk from the industry. Unfortunately, not quite. The other, the other problem is liquidity attracts liquidity, just like any network effect. And so as soon as one venue starts to get large, they, they quickly take all the rest of the business. So you can't just solve the dollars problem, you also need to solve the liquidity problem. Um, now, if you've got, let's, let's imagine, 20 different asset gateways around the world issuing dollars onto a blockchain. These can all then be traded on decentralized exchanges, but if you've got Acme Gateway, ANX Gateway, you know, um, and, uh, dozens of different gateways issuing a token, they're going to be small, fragmented pools of liquidity. No one really wants to go and trade an ANX US dollar, you know, so, so you, you do need some way to, to break that problem of isolated pools of liquidity. And this is where liquidity aggregation comes in. So what ANX has been doing on our retail exchange for five years now is we, we do liquidity aggregation, so basically it's a multi-dimensional order book. If you think about a typical order book, it might be Bitcoin, US dollars. And then if you've got Bitcoin, Euro, that's another order book. They're two pools of liquidity. But if you assemble that into a three-dimensional order book, you can actually pull that together. So you can have a match across the US dollar to the Euro, a match across the US dollar to the Bitcoin and a match to the Euro and the Bitcoin. You can, you can pull together liquidity. And now this is um, the, the, the topic of this speech was multi-dimensional order books. And I've been out trying to place a grant in academic circles for six months on, the, on this topic. So hopefully, hopefully I can make some more progress by stimulating some interest here today. Um, most people are sort of familiar with the idea of a lightning network, you know, which is the fact that you can't do one payment, one settlement event on a blockchain at super high volume. It's just not scalable. You need to be able to do many, many transactions off-chain and then have basically compression, a reduced number of events hitting the blockchain compared to the number of economic transactions that happened. So Lightning Network does this with the idea that you have a balance sheet transaction between two or more individuals, and as transactions occur, the balance sheet transactions get updated and you also have an anti-cheat tran anti transaction. Now that's just one dimension, so say moving Bitcoin. Uh, when you've got smart contracts at your fingertips, it starts to get a bit easier. So, and someone did like a hundred line, really good demo of, of a Lightning Network implementation with Ethereum in about a hundred lines. And then you can actually start to do something a bit more sophisticated. So instead of having just one asset, why don't you, up, why don't you issue balance sheet transactions with two assets? Let's call it Bitcoin and Ethereum or any two tokens against any two others. Now, whenever there's a transaction, it would be an asset swap, and you both parties again release an updated balance sheet transaction, and then you've got asset swap, you've got trading. Now, if you extend that, this is not an easy problem space. I, I certainly don't have all the answers, I just know what I want. Now, if you extend that a little further, back to my comments about liquidity aggregation using more than two dimensions, you can actually start to build up liquidity aggregation on, on a... Um, basically a state channel like type trading network. So it's, we know we need it. We know the industry needs it. The problem is uh, when you try and find people to do it, everyone's doing an ICO, even Raiden now. So we um, but yeah, I've talked to about six universities. They haven't really got the talent. The talent they did have is out helping people with their ICOs. And I guess we've got yeah, five or six different uh, decentralized state channel kind of projects. But that said, um, we've got a grant, and hopefully we can match that into Vitalik's offering. Uh, if anyone is interested in working on state channels without doing an ICO, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, so in the meantime, though, um, from engagement with the industry, it's become quite clear to us that that's not the lower-hanging fruit. You always want to deliver a project in steps of incremental value. And almost everyone we talk to says our biggest problem, 
banking. You know, so we say, right, so if we bring you a high quality network of multiple tether-like fiat tokens that's got dispute resolution, transparent banking, KYC and AML, so that you know that the parties engaging are not likely to get shut down, so the credit risk is good, um, that, then we get a lot of interest. And, that, and that's really where our focus is right now for the next six months. So we've kind of gone back through our backgrounds. We're, we're mostly old bankers, and uh, we've managed to get some super senior, uh, super senior former financial markets, um, financial markets people, and uh, now we're pushing forward at the moment in uh, setting up a very transparent and open technical and legal framework to have many US dollar tethers. And, and this is needed before, before you can engage with any bank in a serious manner. So uh, also, I sort of ask if anyone is actually working on similar projects, is interested in that client money issuing dollar tokens, pl please approach us. We've got a working group. All the legals are free, and that's pretty much a third of our spend. So uh, that said, I'll open the floor to some quick questions. Probably one, point of, one uh, comment worth, worth sharing is we're based in Hong Kong. Most of the retail world thinks Hong Kong is basically just China. I think any, anyone from an institutional background kind of understands Hong Kong. But, but most of the retail world thinks Hong Kong is part of China. And, and everyone saw, I guess, uh, China took a very firm stance against ICOs recently. And we keep getting emails saying, are you guys OK? Are you being shut down? I so said, Hong Kong is actually a separate legal ju jurisdiction to China. But all the same, we are based on the, on the border of China. And there's been a huge amount of turbulence in that whole region you know, in recent months. I hope everyone has a great conference and uh, maybe come and approach me after the speech.